So here we are in beautiful Locarno, Switzerland, where the 68th Festival of Film, Locarno, has just finished, or is actually finishing today. Um, Neil Young and Michael Patterson looking at some of the films that we saw at the festival in this, in this beautiful town in the Swiss Alps that we see behind us. You're not looking at it too much, you're going to oh have dear. to tell them, buddy, that yes. we're actually in prison in Kosovo, yes. uh, at DocuFest, the 16th edition of it? 14th. 14th edition. Oh but my we, god, we, my maths isn't... But, but we have great. been in Locarno before this, so uh, this we, yes, where, we came direct where we got this catalogue from. And today the uh, prizes were announced and we hadn't seen any of the films, <laughs> because we uh, left after five days. Um, and because the way the screenings are clustered together, to, in both public screenings and press screenings, um, because I guess they want to... Uh, invite filmmakers for their films and so they accommodate them for less nights if the films are clustered together. Um, so we have to le we had to leave a third of the way through the festival and uh, Hong Sang Su has just been announced as the winning filmmaker and unfortunately we haven't seen the film. No, and, I, and the title is easy to forget. It, is it right now, wrong then? Right now, wrong then. But you know, you've seen one Hong Sang Su film, you've seen them all I see. And that is not a bad thing because they're all very good. But um, yes. I recently saw one of his, I think the one from last year, Hill of Freedom. Yep. Uh, which was uh, pretty good. Uh, this one is l longer than usual for Hong Sang Su. How long is it? This is two hours. What? Right now, wrong then. Um, when and these uh, guys get self-indulgent, it's uh... yeah, but it's two. It's like Melinda and Melinda of Woody Allen. It's two two sixty-minute films just tell the same story. And one in, of them's right and one of them's wrong. In, in, two, in two slightly different ways. Okay. So it's in a way Hong is a major director who's never won a big prize at a big festival like this. He's never won Cannes, Berlin, or Venice. Mm -hmm. uh, we can we could actually call the Carno the fourth. Could we say there's a big four, or is it? Would you think there's always going to be those big three, and then? No, Lecano. I think Lacano's Lacano would like to be considered as such. I think, and you know, in many ways, it should be because of the reliably strong field of press and industry delegates who attend it every year. And I think this is one of the main reasons I enjoy my time there. In terms of its film program, I enjoy it less than I do socially. But socially is like an over exaggeration because it's. <laughs> There's not much to do there that isn't like extortionate. Punishingly expensive. Yeah. Which is which is why it's nice to be in, in Kosovo where one can have a night night out and still have change from One a, can have a whole a pizza a ten... here or a whole pie um, for one euro fifty. Um, yes. which is not which, an exaggeration at all. Which in, uh, which in Locarno will probably get you a, a an olive, I think. But, but at but some uh, point we're gonna have to just start discussing films we've actually seen. Yes, such as the film which won Best Director, which is uh, which is Cosmos by uh, Andrzej Zurowski. Mm -hmm who is the uh, outstanding Polish director who um, made films such as Possession in, in the 80s and uh, The Important Thing is to Love in the 70s and... Uh, this is his first film in 15 years. His first for 15 it's years. It's an adaptation of the Witold Grimbowicz. Witold Gombrowicz. Gombrowicz. <laughs> you, you're, you're more practiced at this than I am, but um, how, are, you, are you familiar with the, the literary work? I, I, have I have never read anything by Vitol Gombrowicz. I did some research uh, before I saw the film, um, and it is a, apparently untranslatable because it is, about, it is. It is a primarily a book about language and the, the use of language and puns and wordplay and, and deformations of language. And so people say, you know, it's it's essentially can only be experienced in the original language Polish, and if you translate it, it's, it's necessarily going to lose, but lose this quite is, a lot. This is French language. The film. Uh, the films. The films in French. It's a French Portuguese so, co-production. Uh, made made in Portugal, but so a, a book which is regarded as untranslatable and unfilmable. I think it takes a certain amount of cojones mm -hmm. uh, for a director in his first film in 15 years to do this. Uh, various interviewers said to him, you know, you've been off for 15 years. And he was like, well, I haven't been on holiday. I've, I've written 15 books in that period. So he, he, <laughs> has, he has been busy. Um, Gombrowicz was a, a Polish writer, a, a key figure in modernism. Um, and the, the, the film is apparently quite a faithful adaptation, transplanted from a small Polish village to a Portuguese uh, coastal resort where a young man called Witold, called Witold, played by uh, Jonathan Genet, who I didn't know before this, who's very striking, angular, tall, sort of hawk-featured, I think he looks like Jane Birkin personally, but there we are. Um, a, he's a, a law student who arrives uh, for a, a break at this uh, seaside he's, he's place. He's kind of a dropout, a third year dropout, yeah. who, who arrives at this village and is, or and the resort with the ambitions of 
writing his first novel. He wants to write a novel and you see him often in his bedroom typing away frantically like this and, and, and words appear in big uh, word processor on the screen. As I, as I said in my review, the director gets in and amongst it uh, from the word go. Oh, it's a very like, energetic uh, and lively film. Somebody yeah. was asking me the other day, you know, is it, you know, is it like his other stuff or has he tempered himself somewhat? And I said, oh yeah, from the first moment really, five, yeah. within five seconds we have jump cuts, uh, graceful camera pans, uh, voiceover and, and the hysterical the, melodramatic music. And the title just comes on, Cosmos and you're in and, that's and it. it starts, you know, so... Um, not, not and if you like the first 30 seconds, they are very indicative of the rest of the film, you will enjoy it, I think, if you like the first 30 seconds. I was kind of like strikingly ambivalent, I must say, um, and remain so throughout the film. It's a one to kind of admire and respect more than love because the film very deliberately holds you at a, a distance through its formal you know distanciation and um and it wants to do this i think um well it's a very artificial it's a kind of an intellectual i said it's a dramatic exercise rather than a drama per se and it's of course it's very funny at times um and its wordplay is engaging in you know in a sense but that's it for me it didn't really allow me to kind of um engage with it in any other sense because mm. it's a very sort of self-referential self-aware deconstructing film at a certain point Vitold announces that he's no longer writing a novel he's writing a film <laughs> he's named after Vitold Gombrovich yep. um, so it's full of nudge nudge wink wink you have it's there are, it's a farce it's essentially a kind of intellectual farce and you have Sabine Azema who was the the, the widow and muse of um, Alain René mm -hmm. who later in his career made many Alan Eggborn farces mm -hmm. And the film is full of these little uh, little nods and winks to 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 um, Zhuwowski's previous previous films. Mm -hmm. It's kind of funny because Hong Sang Su. I mean, we haven't seen the film, but I've read enough reviews of it. And we, we, if you've seen a Hong Sang Su film, yeah. you can talk about any other. P people Hong who've Sang seen Su a lot of them um, would say, you know, this one is it's a longer version, but it's basically what he's been doing for the last. 15, 20 years. It's like a summarisation. And I just wonder how many people on the jury had actually seen that many <laughs> previous... So who was on the jury? Udo Kier was on the Udo jury. Udo Kier, Jerry Schatzberg, um, the, uh, Nadav Lapid, the Israeli director, um, Moon Suri, who is a South Korean actress who has appeared in three films. Of by, Hong Sang Soo. Of Hong Sang Soo. So she's a... She's not entirely. A she's yeah. perhaps the Isabel Huppert. But this of is jury. the joy of juries, I think. And, and Daniela Mich Michel, a festival director from Mexico. I'm sure she's seen several Hong Sang Soo films. <laughs> One would hope. But I, I would be very surprised if Udo Kier, maybe even Jerry Schatzberg, knows who he is. Yeah, because a lot of people are like, oh, you know, yet another Hong Sang Soo film. But if, if you haven't seen one, it's fresh and surprising. Very revelatory. And, he, and, yeah, and he's yeah. obviously a very good writer, he's very good with actors. Um, and they're not kind of tough. Films. In fact, I mean, very, even very even simple. within one film, one scene to the next, it's like, no. have I haven't I just watched this? And it's yeah. like well, uh, his scripts yeah. develop. Repetition um, is very much way of this, yeah. is part of his thing because the characters are normally filmmakers of some description or writers, and uh, repetition of multiple ways of telling stories. I just love the fact that we're expanding at great length about this film <laughs> that neither of us have seen. But was Cosmos the best film you saw in the corner? No, uh, it was not the best film. Uh, what the was? best. The, the, well, I didn't see that many films in competition. I think I saw four. The best one. You was, were there for three viewing days, right? I was there four. For Three, 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 viewing days. three viewing days and I only saw new films I didn't walk out of anything I saw everything on the big screen I was very kind of disciplined in that because such a recentist I had I had a limited spell look at you were able to dive into the Sam Peckinpah well I was this that, this is my third consecutive time and third time overall in the corner um, they keep inviting me back so I'm happy to attend um, but this year was the the least kind of commissions I've had in a way before I attended, before I arrived, sorry. So I was able to kind of fill my time with whatever I wanted to, really. And because I saw, I'm not familiar at all with Sam Peckinpah's work, well, and they had, had a you retrospective had, you'd, you'd seen this Straw year. Dogs, I I've seen Straw Dogs before I kind of knew who, you know, directors were, really, never mind Sam Peckinpah. Um, I knew it as a kind of a, a boring film. Uh, and, I haven't, dog? and I boring? haven't, yeah, and I haven't watched Stray it. Dogs by Simon <laughs> Liang, <laughs> which is not boring, <laughs> very but, boring, you know, whatever. It's a, great, um, it's a great, boring film. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar with this work. I haven't seen Straw Dogs since I've become familiar with uh, with with Sam Peckinpah's name, and this was kind of my first introduction. So I saw, I concentrated on the 35 millimeter stuff as one should in Locarno because it's it's a it's one of the great festivals for. Screening 35 millimeter although where they're possible. Although they, they also do show quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of DCP. Quite mm -hmm. a, a, lot, a lot of the older films do go on DCP. Yeah, they do. But uh, this is you know I, I don't I mean Cannes doesn't show any 35 yeah. stuff. I'm just I'm 
just looking. The, uh, the, the, I don't the, think Venice does. The other big retrospective was the Russian master who I've never had never heard of, Marlon Kutsiev mm -hmm. uh, of Georgian. Uh, he's like ninety one. Yeah, or 90. He's, he's a he's a Georgian who, who, who was based in Russia for a long time. And I'm looking. And he made seven films in his career, and I think they shot all of them, maybe apart from one. And there was all all on thirty five, apart from actually no, all on thirty five millimeter. Yeah. So yeah, so the Peck and Par. What was the best of the Peck and Pars for you? Um, I saw Major and Dundee firstly with Charlton Heston, Richard Harris, and uh, James Coburn, and it's in, in many ways it anticipates um, Heaven's Gate, which also screened at the festival as part of the Michael Cimino retrospective, um, and we'll get onto that later. But um, Major Dundee's like this great work, I think. You know, there's 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 things that I didn't quite get I don't think but you know there's even when you're not getting why, it why, why is it a great film I think it's a great film because of its uh, <laughs> good question um, it's cinematography is wonderful it's a Western but it kind of it, it rubs against the um, tropes if you like of the Western genre and it does so in very in, uh, invigorating ways it's a very violent film for its time and you know, enduringly so. Because Peck and Par is famous for his for his what at the time was considered extreme violence. Yeah, I mean, I think it's still striking, and, and, and but it's it's not brutal. It's a, he's a very kind of uh, humane director, I think, on this on the evidence of the four films I saw there. Right, he's, so he's, he's also famous for slow motion violence. He is. Does that, does that take the edge off it? Do you it think? doesn't. No, I don't think it does. Um, it's. Um, in in many ways, it kind of emphasises it, but doesn't glorify it in a way. It's 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 easier seen than described in his films as violence anyway. But um, I also saw a very non-violent film by him, uh, Junior Bonner, which he made in the seventies with Steve McQueen. Um, and this is a rodeo picture. It's in many ways an ode or a hymn to the fading uh, West. And uh, it's not a western; it's a contemporary picture. And it's the uh, we were it was introduced the film and uh by whom um oh don't ask that I don't know. I, no 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 it wasn't she uh, introduced major dundee all right and also uh the wild bunch oh yeah uh, that she appeared in and i hadn't seen the wild bunch before i'd seen i've got it on i've had it on vhs for about six seven years no so, probably so, longer than so that. so would, would you say as a result of this you are like now a peck and par fan You're i would and say past? i am very much a peck and par fan and very much looking forward to watching <laughs> the Wild Bunch on DV, uh, VHS, but um, again, um, it's you know his work is it's it's sprawling and um, kind of very self-indulgent, and he was a, apparently a very difficult director to work with, as all greats tend to be. Um, and he died prematurely, you know, he was an mm. alcoholic by the time he died. And, um, and he wore a bandana. He wore a bandana, which is always always a plus in Neil Young's mm -hmm. universe. Yes, in fact, I, I no, I didn't I didn't bring my bandana. Oh, I did bring my bandana. So of course, you brought your bandana. Yes. Um, are you going to wear it? I may, I may well wear okay. it. Okay, uh, but no, Junior Bonner is a, an unexpectedly non-violent, very moving film. It's a drama. Um, Steve McQueen kind of acts his heart out in it, in very subtle ways, in a way that I didn't, ex I didn't know Steve McQueen could. Um, and it's there's just things happening in it always, oh. you know. And as a, as a, you know, I, as I as I wrote about it, I said, you know, the only constant in history is flux. And it's a film that's constantly fluctuating in its dramatic um, movement. And uh, <laughs> funnily enough, I, uh, I w when watching it, I heard a, a thunder, a crash of thunder in the in the picture, and I thought oh. it was part of the film. Mm -hmm. And then realised that <laughs> the film is like unflinchingly sunny. Mm -hmm. And then realised it was uh, rain outside. And because it, I, I always think one of the things about Locarno is the weather is always horrible. It can be a very unpleasant place it's, to be. It's either roastingly hot. I mean, I'm wary of a cr film critic complaining about his lot, but uh, <laughs> but, but Locarno is a test because it's either too hot, too wet, too humid. And there was one day where it was scorching hot. Then it was horrible, sweaty, sweltering. Well, it's like you're, you're frightened to damn it the sun because um, you know that the alternative is a biblical downpour and mm. when it does come down it, it really does because I was going to watch coming back to the Chimino retrospective one of what I think is one of my favorite films uh, I watched it with my family on Christmas Day a few years back and we'd all seen it already I know you watched it one uh, New Year's Eve the same year or the year after we're about this the is the Deer Hunter, the Deer Hunter. and uh, it was a midnight screen and I don't know whose idea that was which also features bandana open air yes it does indeed open air screening on the Piazza Grande at midnight it's a three-hour film 
and I don't know whose idea that was and it was rained off you know I in the end I felt kind of justified because I opted for drinks with good pals to catch yeah. up but, and I but, felt guilty because you know it's like DCP so I can see it whenever but um, to watch it in the Piazza Grande which when it was my third uh, first visit there to the festival the very first night I watched Chinatown which was already oh, yeah. a favorite of mine and to see it, it's a great introduction to the festival to watch a film in this mm -hmm. space that is open air and therefore you would expect it to be quite uh, conducive to whisperers and chatters but it's not the case, they're very respectful the local audiences in, in, in Locarno and I actually think the local audiences help to, as I've also written, temper the whiff of entitlement that can bleed over from the press tent. Uh, and crit critics complaining about the weather as I, as I was just doing but the Piazza Grande for people who don't know is 7,000 seats in the main square of Locarno, which is like a long main square with restaurants all it's along a rectangle, the side. Yeah, restaurants all along the side, and it kind of goes like that, and it's got this huge screen. And it, it is the famous thing in Locarno; it's the unique selling point of the festival. It is. There's also the Fevi venue, which is one of the worst <laughs> venues in the world. But the festivals. Um Acquired this as a permanent Fe cinema. Fevy, yeah, Fevy is like a huge basketball court of a building with, with, with movable with, seats, with movable plastic seats. The rake is terrible, and it holds three thousand people. So there's there's always twenty people coming in, and there's always twenty people going out. So to me, it's like watching a film in a railway station. I didn't go this year. Actually. I avoided it. I, I boycotted it. Last yeah. year, I trudged along in again another biblical downpour. My flip flops with a feeling very sorry for myself as buses, shuttle buses, were going back and forth past me, yeah. and. Uh, spraying me with puddles and the first year I went to the corner I saw short term 12 there so it is oh, yeah. a you know it's a decent venue yeah. if it strikes an audience there yeah. because as but, I say the audiences are very appreciative but, but you do have sort of two it's a two center festival you have the main city center of Locarno that has a Piazza Grande X Rex which is a beautiful cinema for the retrospectives the Cursal where they have the press screenings the Rialto all quite close to each other then you have a, a more modern uh, sort of new town area on the edge of town which they put buses on where they have the Fevy and they have uh, one or two screening rooms and this festival I, de I deliberately avoided the Fevy area I just stayed in this one area um, but I wanted to mention one of the films in competition and, and talk about Peckinpah and genre films which we you know are traditionally in some some quarters still denigrated and, and I d it wasn't a surprise that the best film I saw in competition was the one that I knew would win nothing and that is Schneider versus Bax by Did Alex. you like it? I liked it, yes. By Alex. Film. It's a very good uh, dark comedy thriller by Alex Van Warmedam, who is, uh, you could probably call him the Holland's leading director. Who, I mean, Paul Verhoeven's based. Uh, I haven't seen his previous Gold. stuff. His most recent was Borgman. His most it? recent was Borgman, which was in competition in Cannes, which was uh, a film that starts gangbusters and you the first five minutes is this storm of cinema and you're like wow you can't sustain this and, and he doesn't but there's good <laughs> the, but there's good things in it then the last 20 minutes it just collapses into a heap of nonsense oh really and it, then it just fizzles away and ends and and a lot of his films are like this do you he, think this one's more sustained yeah but you're watching it and it's got this comic energy it, it'll be compared with the coen brothers because it's about a hip a hit man who has to kill a writer is that a dig because i did I compared it to the Coen Brothers. I said it was um, a tight, a silly will, version will, of a Coen Brothers it will, film. It will be inevitably compared to the Coen Brothers. I think you know that uh, that's the genre that, that he's working. Now with I feel it. cliched. No, but, no, um, I, it has to be said. But 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 I think that it sustains up to a, a long way. But you're just waiting for him. You're waiting for the plates to fall. You're waiting for him to drop it. And the last five minutes, you kind of think, oh, is that is that how it's going to end? You know, then it then it just fizzles away and ends. And you think, is he doing it deliberately? Because if he's if he's that good a writer, if he's that good a director, yeah. he must. It's like a perverse withholding of of, of audience pleasure. Um, I think it'll play in a lot of festivals. I think it'll get released in a lot of places. If it was French or it Scandinavian, wasn't, funnily enough, it wasn't a world premiere in the corner because it's already been it's already been, it's, released. It's, it's, it's already in the been Netherlands. it's already been out in um, in the Netherlands. But um, yeah, if it was like Swedish or Norwegian, it would be it would be a big hit and everybody would be going crazy about it. But there's something about Dutch cinema, the uh, cinema that people kind of like. Oh, Dutch! I don't know what it is. Uh, there's something slick about Dutch films. It's something that. But it doesn't help. Can't, it doesn't. Quite get yeah, into. it doesn't do its own cause very very well. Is that a sentence? Um, I know what you mean. It doesn't do itself of any favours in this regard, I think, because it is it is kind of a nonsensical film it and is. it's very slickly done and it's got this kind of. Not a yellow tinge, but it's like it's oh, cinematography. To look at. Yeah, it's, even, it's, even though the locations is beautiful, uh, like a hut on a lake, which is like a holiday cabin. Yeah. This beautiful, it's like I mean, interior decorators are going to love this film. This completely white painted cabin, which this this which this seedy writer, played by Alex Van Warmerdam, yeah. uh, is residing in. But having been to Holland quite a few times, to me, it's not just a daft thriller, because or daft comedy thriller, because it's about the two ways of being Dutch. You can either be a druggie 
pot smoking, uh, take it easy man, right. or you can be a hyper organized, efficient, oh, yeah, hard working, hard working person. Of it in that way. So uh, Schneider, who's the, the hit man, mm -hmm. is this very methodical, very professional family man, full of responsibility. And I like no nonsense protagonists. It reminded me actually of uh, In the Shadows, which I borrowed from oh, you yeah. a few years ago. Thomas, uh, Thomas Arslan's uh, German, German, which German thriller. Which has a similarly no nonsense uh -huh. protagonist who just gets on with it and is, you know that if he wants to kill someone he's going to and he's not going to, yeah. there's not going to have that moment where, you know, he, he gives a monologue and clicks the uh, yeah. gun. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, as I say, this, I is, this had a similar feel to it, but then it's, he's opposed to this other kind of bumbling, uh, mm -hmm. World weary, who at a certain point, because he's like recovering from a from a heavy night, <laughs> at a certain point he just kind of like flakes out and he has to, and the, and the drugs kind of stop working on him and he has to just lie down for quite a while. So, and as I say, played by the director. So, watched it, liked it, everybody loved it, thought it was a, one of the best films, and everybody knew it wasn't going to win anything. Yeah. Because it's a, it's a, it's a light, it's too yeah, light. Yeah, genre is maligned at every festival. It's not yeah. specific to Le Corno, I think. The best film I saw there was also not a world premiere at Le Corno. I think it premiered at Sundance, an American, one of two American films in competition, the other of which was uh, entertainment. This was James White by Josh Mond, the debut direct, uh, directorial is debut it not, by Is it him. not Josh Mond directed by James White? It could be. I, I think. I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is like... Is it about Jimmy White, the, the snooker player? Who it is about Jimmy venerate? White and it's about uh -huh. his travails on the billiard circuit oh, yeah. and he tries to renew his career um, and doesn't. And mm. feels no. It's um. It's about a Manhattanite, twenty-something Manhattanite uh, called James White, played by Christopher Ar uh, Abbott, and uh, who previously had small roles in uh, Martha Marcy May Marlene, uh, nicely done, um, and he plays, as I said, twenty-something Manhattanite who um, who at the beginning of the film his father's just died. Mr. White is Mr. White. His mother wasn't with his father, and he meets his stepmother who he only found out existed a week before. It sounds like a soap opera. And it's... Um, it, sounds like a, it sounds like a TV movie. And there's a week-long wake, because he's Jewish, so it's a shiver. Right. Um, and it's hosted by his mother, who is played by Cynthia Nixon, who we learn at the outset um, is a recent uh, survivor of cancer. Right. This, this, sounds like this, a bad, guy, this sounds like a bad TV yeah, movie. Yeah, to, to read the synopsis, it's... Uh, it's pretty cliched and trite, but the way um, Josh Mond handles it, it's very naturalistic, and it's profitably uh, low key, and it's uh, you know it, it does it's cinematography is like you know the shadow depth uh, is it like thing a, that is I it, don't like. Could, could it be classified as mumblecore? No, I don't think so because I it feels very scripted. Um, it, it stars in a supporting role, Kid Cudi, called Scott Miss Cudi in real life. Um, who is Kid Cudi? Uh, a musician, you don't oh, right. know who Kid Cudi is. Vaguely. He did that. I'm not, uh, I'm not as down with the kids. I'm not, not as down with the kids. I'm not going to sing the song, but uh, you know, you'll know it if you hear it. All right. But uh, and he shows himself as a kind of a great untapped talent, uh, and he plays um, a homosexual who whose sexuality is very casualized. It's not nothing's made of it. I think there were some deleted scenes that elaborate on this further, and I found it kind of refreshing in this sense because you know not enough. Uh, films, I think, uh, have these characters that aren't issues based. You know, it's not about him, it's just, you know, he happens to be gay and that's that. But, um. I mean, this is 2015, one would have thought that, it, absolutely. that, that American films could yeah, I remember, I remember praising Takeshi Kitano's films for this reason, mm. you know. And, and ca casting, a, casting a singer who doesn't, isn't known as an actor, that was what Robert Altman would often do. Is, there, is it like, a, could, you, could it be described as an Altman esque film in any way? Um, no, all right. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's very it's, it's kind of painful to watch because actually the the by the end of the film and the second half of it the main thrust is uh, the mother's cancer returns and it's about him caring for her in a society an American society that in which this can be very very difficult to do you know as a carer of a parent um, that doesn't you know have free health care and stuff and it's. Uh, so you would see, you see Josh Mond is, a, is, is emerged as an American director to watch with this He's film? He's one to watch. He's right. a talent to watch, <laughs> as is Scott Muscudi. Uh, and I also, I hope I'm pronouncing that Speaking right. of uh, American directors, uh, we can talk about, in connection with this festival, DocuFest, uh, Travis Wilkerson's new film, Machine Gun or Typewriter. Which premiered at Locarno, uh -huh. and a couple of days later had its uh, an, another kind of simultaneous premiere in Prisoner. Now, th this is a festival of, uh, Prisoner and DocuFest, as, it, as the title suggests, is a documentary film festival. Yes. And 
and you were on the international competition jury for the documentary. The international docs. International jury. docs competition, and, yes. the, and the prize has gone to a fiction film. <laughs> so this is my main what, argument what, against what, it. What, que pasa? What's going on here? You there know, is there nah, are fictions, there are documentaries, you, let's not blur the boundaries. As you comically uh, said before I'd watched the film, I said, is it a, is it a documentary? And you said, there are facts in it. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not obviously yeah, not a it's definition a kind of, it's of a It's a kind of bizarre film. socialist love story, which which is a bizarre socialist you, you would you would presumably respond to very deeply. I'm a bizarre socialist? Yeah, bizarre socialist love story. Curiously triangle. socialist uh, film critic Michael yeah. Patterson. Quintessentially socialist. Um, this is, it's a kind it's a... Agit prop noir film, I think, as, okay. as I think he's just, described it himself. No, I think uh, oh, right. I read I read something that uh -huh. described it as such. Um, but um, th this is like, you know, it's an essay film in which the narrator, who is uh, operating a illegal uh, pirate radio broadcast, who's trying to find a former love through whom uh, he engaged more deeply with the politics that he was already practicing. Uh, or thinking rather, and he gets involved in it in, in terms, and, and you know, it's a kind of a... She answers an advert, does not support it, because yeah. he, he says, um, he poses the question, uh, do, do, I, do I join the revolutionary struggle in the 21st century with a machine gun or with a typewriter? Yeah, that's the premise. I mean, why it's either or, I don't know, but apparently it's either or. And, and she responds, what does she respond? Machine gun, of course. Yeah, machine gun, you know, of course. So and he doesn't know who it's from, and it's anonymous, and he yeah. ends up meeting her. And it's it's um, but the whole narration because it's it's an essay film, so we never get to know who the character is. It doesn't he doesn't it's have you, a face. You, well, you, yeah, you just kind it's of behind his, a radio yeah, mic. It's it's it's, it's, it's uh, obscured by the microphone. Um, um, but he, but, he, but he it's a very amusing narration actually because he he has these very strategic pauses in which he has to be very precise with his wording, and uh, it's in second person also because it's addressed to his love, and I won't mm. reveal what happens, yeah. uh, whether or not he finds her, but. Um, but a lot of it is them, him, him recalling walking around Los Angeles and going to the Times building and various other sites where, which tie in with either left-wing activity or repression of left-wing activity. Mm -hmm. They go to a, a cemetery which has various um, people connected with the revolutionary cause. Mm -hmm. um, and I kind of was, I was thinking, you know, I'd rather a more conventional film in which we actually go around Los Angeles because you know it's my favourite city. I love walking around Los Angeles. I love the radical history of Los Angeles, and people don't know about it. And we get it in some films. It touches like, upon it. Yeah, it touches upon it. But it's not it. about it. No, but it's it's how it's how romance and politics intersect. What's your favourite film about Los Angeles? Ah, uh, oh, whoa, 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 whoa! Yeah. My favourite film about Los Angeles is oh, well, Point Blank of uh, of John Borman is Los okay. Angeles, isn't which it? I haven't seen. I think. Um, which which is a kind of very in, in, in Los Angeles. I borrowed it off your friend Matt, who works in Phoenix. Yes, sorry, Matt, you haven't given it back. But it's uh, but it's very much about Los Angeles in a time of uh, change when the freeways are being built and the car was taking over, um, and um, Lee Marvin's walking around Los Angeles being a, being a tough guy. Uh, whether, is that my favourite film about Los Angeles? It's 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 certainly in my top fifteen, and it's about Los Angeles. So we'll go with that. Okay. What is your favourite film about Los Angeles? Um, apart, from, apart from apart from Machine Gun or Typewriter? Lost. By James Benning, which was also in my in my mind, and, and would would definitely be my top top ten films about Los Angeles. Lost and Chinatown. Or heat. What about Chinatown? Chinatown, Lost, and Heat. Right. That's my top three. There, there, there's, there's but I've the, never the, been to Los Angeles, so I've right. never had the fortune of visiting it uh -huh. um, and experiencing it firsthand. But you said that your favourite film of, of uh, Locarno was um, was uh, Josh Mond's James White. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I saw that you tweeted that your favourite film of Locarno was by Lois Patino. In fact, I didn't see that. Didn't you? I thought I thought you said the best one of the best one of the best new films was by Lois Patino. It was one of the best. Right. Who I you know I've just had the fortune of spending a week with on the Jew here in Prisrin, another one who went direct from Locarno mm -hmm. to Prisrin. And um, but this, the, uh, but the, the films he by had Lois, two films. One yeah. of which was a world premiere at Locarno. They were part of the same program. One of which was a world premiere at Villa de Conde, the Shorts Festival that initiated it. Um, and one of which is called Colors, Stratum of Colors, Stratas Strat Strat of the Image, Stratas of the Image, which is about colors. Uh -huh. Colors aren't in the title. Um, and the other of which is called Dis. Uh, Night. Night Without Distance. Night Without Distance. Yeah, and both of these, I mean, they're short films, they're like less than, what, 50, or I think 20 minutes? Yeah. One and about 10 minutes, the other one. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> short films get overlooked at festivals, they get kind of a bit ghettoized, unless it's a short film festival. Yeah. Um, Which and, we never get any coverage anyway. Yeah, and, and these, these films are kind of hidden away in a, in a, in a shorts program, 
Um, what is it about Patino that makes him? I think you've, you've described him as one of the great image makers of current cinema. Yeah, what, I said. I, what, what is it about I, Patino's visual? Oomph? Well, he his first feature-length film, Costa de Mort, actually premiered in Locarno three years ago, and I was one of the first critics to write about it. And uh, you know, I only went to see it actually because I'd previously met the producer and, and stayed with the producer in Portugal, although he's not Portuguese, in Indy Lisboa in 2013. It's like the career of Michael Patterson, you know. um, Martin Pauli, right. one of two producers okay. of the film. So, what so is I only went to see it what is because it of this Patino? landscape films, as we know, and I thought I was very intrigued by the way he kind of flattened the image of, of Galicia and Costa de Mort. Uh, the way he kind of shoots from afar but zooms in enough to flatten it, if you know what I mean. So all of the contradictions of this place's very specific history are kind of competing with one another in, a, in an imagistic sense. Mm -hmm. And that film, and I found that it film very profitable. Uh, played in many festivals, it had great success, uh, made his name, won lots of prizes, and um, I think he's now established as a kind of leading younger European director. Absolutely. And the two films that were here were, to me, genuinely experimental, that were in Locarno, were genuinely experimental. It felt like he was trying stuff out in terms of, what if I do this? What if I do that? How will this, you know? Yeah, well, you worry when you see something like Costa de Mort and, and the tract that it garnered, you worry that it's a fluke or like a one-off and you and you know you kind of watch the follow-ups with kind of like a mm. half a cringe um, ready but uh, you know I, I must say it's not a fluke for Costa de Mort because mm. this is a guy who's deeply engaged with landscape and questions of space mm. and uh, but, <laughs> to but, just but, but to talk but, about uh, distance, yeah. night, night, night Without Distance, without distance is entirely done in it's negative negativized. yeah so the image is so this like, and it wasn't this, conceived as such so he the said sky is dark. he said um, he only came up with this kind of concept two days before filming began, and because uh, it's about a group of smugglers on the border, on the border of Portugal Galicia and, and Portugal, yeah, and uh, they're kind yeah. of lurking around in these hillsides in this kind of and, and you can't tell whether it's nighttime limbo. or daytime, whatever yeah. it is, because everything is but it's beautiful. Is, is, everything is it's, it's not just negative. Well, it is just negativized, uh, but it actually looks like a CGI created. Landscape. But do you think if, do you think if you took the negative negative is negativization off, to me it just felt like a kind of a fairly stilted, cliched yeah. thing about blokes lurking around in the forest. Yeah. Very kind of artificial and um, this ominous ominous dialogue and a bit yeah, stiff. Yeah. The negativization makes it seem uh, it enlivens it by mm. seem, making it seem very artificial. The bit that I loved in it was you see like rocks on a hillside, and so because it's shadows sort of within the rocks, it looks like there was light coming out of the rocks yeah, yeah. in this sort of science fiction-y sort of thing. And the other one, uh, Stratus of the Image, I think it's called, yeah. is basically a man standing in front of a waterfall. Well, which it's a still, I think. Ah. This is like a, it's a silhouette still with a waterfall imposed behind it. Right. I mean, this is my interpretation of how it was done. I haven't asked Luis how it was done. In a way, I kind of don't want to know. That's part of its magic. Mm -hmm. And uh, it begins as a monochrome palette and the waterfall is the only thing that's colored going from you know blues to greens to yellow to red and it's done in a very fluid way and it's you know it's a beautiful film to watch it reminded me very much of like 60s trip LSD hey man this film's so great when you're high you know and it had this and it was like we're looking at a lava lamp in a, in a beautiful uh, cinematic way yeah. um, so pretty pictures I'm always wary of pretty pictures but but they're undeniably striking and you know hopefully Lois is yeah, now it is what it is you know it's yeah. like a uh, and there's, it's no shame or, or yeah. you know, there's no hiding from it. it but is, I've got so. to say that my, the best new, the, the, the best new film I saw, I mean, I mentioned Schneider vs. Bax um, as the best in the competition that I saw, is, um, it's called The Lesson of the Muses by José Luis Guerin. Guerin which I skipped to watch Junior Bonner. Uh, who's also Spanish, he's Catalan, um, Lois is Galician. Mm -hmm. Galician. Yeah. And this is Girin's first fiction film for eight years, although at the beginning you just think this is documentary. Yeah. It's because it says an educational experience with this lecturer, and he's, and, he's, and he's talking and you think, oh my God, it's going to be two hours of just some guy lecturing about muses and what the muse is. And does he? No, um, it very quickly uh, moves on to his students, and then you see him with his wife, and it's how he, he talks about the women being an inspiration to artists, and he wants to create this tradition again of women inspiring painters and all that kind but of thing. But again, to, to have this film synopsized to you, it sounds very trite and cliche. Yeah, it sounds terrible. And um, Can I have some of that water? And then, and then you realise sure. that, that, uh, that this guy is using all of this muses and philosophy as a way of getting into the pants of his students. 
Um, okay, right. And his wife knows about it, and at a certain point, there's a, there's a discussion between the wife and one of his students, stroke muses, stroke um, women that he's having an affair with. Yeah. And at that point, you kind of think, this, this it can't be a documentary. You can't have like this confrontation between the mistress and the wife. I mean, but it's so well done. Mm -hmm. But. The, you know, with this elusive blurring of documentary and fiction, it's just you kind of think this it just can't it can't be a documentary. Yeah. But it looks kind of cheap. It's made with these cheap cameras. Yeah, it, and it, it has. It this seems like one of those films whose stills just make it look like a boring, ugly picture. Yeah, but the stills are actually brilliant. There's one where it's it's the, this beautiful Italian woman and the, and this sort of pudgy, schlubby lecturer guy standing behind her, and three men who in the still they look as if they're having this like conspiracy conference. And what it actually is is the Sardinian shepherds. Right. doing this um, three-part harmony where one of them is the voice of the sheep, one of them is the voice of the <laughs> cow, and one of them is the voice of the goat. And it's just amazing. I mean, it's, I immediately went out and I was like, Sardinian shepherd songs on YouTube. Yeah. And um, because the origin of music, as this film posits, is from shepherds who would make noises and bells were used so that the, the, the each animal would have a different bell. Right. So that's the origin of instruments. Right. And the songs of the shepherds were used to attract the sheep and all that kind of thing. And then they just started singing among themselves. Right. Okay. So you're learning a lot about, well, I mean, it might be all lies, I don't know, but you're learning a lot about different things while you're watching this very fascinating, weirdly hybrid of, of fiction and documentary. And again, this is his first film in... It's, it's actually his... I mean, he, he made, docu he made a, docu a few documentaries four years ago. This is his first fiction film for eight years. And uh, everybody that saw it was just like, oh, this is... Yeah, it was like the find terrific. of the festival, and I was kind yeah. of sick. So I'm still sick of people telling me that I should see it, because they all <laughs> they all told me that I should see it when I was leaving the next day and couldn't see any more film. Um, and, and, and the other thing was everybody was saying, well, why isn't it in competition? Mm -hmm. Because Locarno does put, doc I mean, it's not a documentary, but you could put it in competition One film easily. that was in competition that is a documentary, that was also by an established name, and it's her first film in a few years, is Chantal Ackerman's uh, No, no Home, Home Movie, movie right. which I felt shouldn't have been in competition and was in there because of the reputation of its director and not on merit. This is a Stop fighting talk from Patterson. Seriously, I don't, I don't like, I ha actively dislike this film, but I don't begrudge it an audience. I don't even begrudge it exhibition. But to put it in documentary, I think is revealing of the ways in which festivals. Put it in competition, cover, you mean? To what, what did you I said say? Put it in documentary. To put it in competition <laughs> is revealing of the way festivals of a certain ilk and repute work, um, and it's. I mean, it's about you know Chantal Ackerman. It's the title's a pun because it is a whole movie. It's um, it's about her, her relationship with her mother, whose health was rapidly declining. At the not, she didn't make the film because of that, and it do, and her and her health deteriorates. Her mother's health um, in ways that she couldn't have foreseen, and so that kind of informs the film's lack of structure. And it's like you know to ask an audience to sit through this 115-minute documentary, deeply personal documentary. Um, and it's all made in her, in her front room, I think, in, in her Belgian apartment. And also it's interspersed with scenes from uh, her travels in Israel, Chantal Ackerman's travels. And you know, we're, we're asked and made to sit through films, uh, sorry, scenes in which nothing happens, right? Which, you know, as I've just said my favourite film about Los Angeles is Lost, in which, you know, nothing happens. Nothing happens. Yeah. But, uh, you know, one, one great film is another... You know, whatever. But, 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 um, for, but for the people who love Chantal Ackerman, of whom there are many, and uh, like Joanna Hogg, yep. uh, the top British filmmaker, is, is, is doing a whole many years retrospective of it, all yep. of her films in London. Um, who, and Chantal Ackerman came to prominence in 1975-6 with uh, Jeanne Dielman, uh, 1020 Rue de Sutton Quai de Bruxelles, in which it's a woman in an apartment. Yes. Doing, doing and stuff it's, for, but it's, a, it's for three hours. I mean, it's a fictional film, but it's yeah. structuralist, right? Uh -huh. so, and it's, it's dramatic. Um, impetus, if you like, is built around its structure, and this, for me, is like, you but, know, self-indulgence is a defining trait of all art. I know this, mm -hmm. right? But as I've, you know, written elsewhere, it depends on the self being indulged, right? But and doesn't Ackerman, me, doesn't Ackerman at this point in her career, isn't, isn't, don't you say, right? You, you know, you're obviously established as a great filmmaker. This is the film you want to make. It's, it's I, by the sound of it, I haven't seen the film. It's a companion piece to Jeanne Dielman, mm -hmm. which is a woman in an apartment in Brussels, mm -hmm. you know, doing stuff. So, you know, I, th I think by the sense of it, I think you're being a little bit harsh on, on her and the festival. But it's, it's, 
the implication here, right, is that the byline carries inherent value. Mm. Right? Inherent vice? <laughs> and I don't think that should be the case. And I don't think it is the case here. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, if to go in... So if somebody had never, if somebody unfamiliar. had never heard of Chantal Ackerman, yep. didn't know about the type of cinema that yeah, she makes. Yeah, fucking shit. So, so like, I take a friend of mine in in Sunderland back home, and he doesn't know Chantal Ackerman, and she doesn't know Chantal Ackerman. Is they're going to be sitting there going, "What does Neil drag me into here?" Yes, absolutely. Right. You know, it's so unrelatedly personal, and there's no attempt to kind of. I mean, you know, Lacano has a history of these kinds of deeply personal autobiographical documentaries. What now remind me by uh, yeah, Joaquin Pinto, Pinto won a few years back, yeah. um, won some kind of award. I think yeah, it won, won the won Presky the, Award. Yeah, I think it also won the Grand Jury Prize. Yeah, yeah. and uh, this, I, this, I, this, this, this operates within those lines, mm -hmm. and, it, and it asks us to kind of okay. It, one would say, you know, uh, a, a, a terrible critic would would call it a brave film. Because it's you know it's opening up and it's revealing of herself in ways that her previous works aren't. Uh, so one can say to some extent that she's putting herself out there, if you like. But you know, as, as a film, as a process, I think this film would have been um, difficult to make. She said she's she's admitted since that if she'd known it was going to be a film, she probably wouldn't have been able to make it. And I think that shows in the film. It's like you know to make a two-hour to make an audience sit through this two-hour work. It's but people like, were applauding and crying and and booing. Yeah, and but I only well you don't know that, but I only saw it in the press screening, which as we know are soulless screenings anyway. And I don't know if a, I don't know if a public would engage with it. I know that you know critics who are obviously aware who it is are applauding the byline, not the film. Well, I, I always remember when I was at Edinburgh Film Festival years ago, I took a friend who's. A, literate, intelligent guy, does, he watches films and you know, knows about films, and I said, we're going to watch two films this afternoon. One of them was The Happiness of the Katakuris by Takashi Miki, a crazy zombie comedy musical, and the other one was uh, Ten by Kiara Starmi. Mm -hmm. And we came out of them and I said, one of these two directors is, is regarded as one of the great directors in the world. And he said, it must be the Japanese guy, because I'm not watching any more films about women driving taxis around Iran. <laughs> and for about six months after that, whenever I said to him, should we go to the pictures? He went, no more women taxi drivers. <laughs> so, And, you know, then Kerry Stomy followed it up with Five, yeah. in which he, he takes the Michael, let's say, to put it politely. Um, he's, it's, I mean, let's not get on to Kerry Stomy. By the way, that's a, the sound of a mosque that you can hear. It's the sound of many mosques, because um, Prisran has dozens of mosques, and this is the 7.44, uh, today is the evening prayer, It is, which I think is the, oh, the Usa, I don't, I don't oh, say no, the wrong I don't thing, I, I did do some research. So at this point I think we should fall silent and allow people just for a few minutes or a few seconds to listen to the beautiful sounds of downtown Prisren, which you don't hear in Locarno. Okay, Even so allow the silence. <laughs> Cameraman, uh, Uma, if you can pick up the camera and just show the town now, please.
Great. That's it. Thank you. Cheers. You can kill it. Yeah.